Welcome back to another episode of Powershead Radio. I'm your host, Karima Mutlu. And on today's show, we have Anthony Molesky, who is the chairman and CEO of Cobalt 27. How are you today, Anthony? Great. Uh, thanks for uh, having me back today. It's always, uh, it's always great to come by and, uh, and talk with the team. Let's start by getting your views on the nickel market today. Recently, there's been a lot of news regarding the commercial production of 811 batteries from leading battery makers for electric vehicles. For example, Nissan's battery supplier recently announced that they plan to start focusing on this battery chemistry going forward. So is the shift towards 811 perhaps increasing at a faster rate than most analysts imagined? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I think that there's a lot of noise around around this particular area because the battery makers, uh, they actually sit in Asia, and so there's not a lot of visibility on what's going on. So first of all, a little background for the listener. You know, when the battery chemistry started off, it was a one, one, one. In other words, one part nickel, one part manganese, one part cobalt. And really today, I would say the most ubiquitous chemistry is the 532, slowly shifting into the 622 and ultimately onto the 811. And while we will definitely arrive at the 811 and frankly we'll probably go a step past that something like you know the 8 8 point you know 5 and 0.25 0.25 I mean, we're talking a decade out now 15 years out um, to get there takes a tremendous amount of time capital and in particular in the west safety review so as you move into that higher nickel density battery you increase the uh, possibility of thermal runaway which is the temperature at which that battery catches fire and ultimately is impossible to put out in any practical sense. So uh, with that background, what I would say is the the battery makers, cathode makers, they're definitely heading that way. And inside of China in particular, we've seen uh, makers really try to accelerate that. But, you know, ultimately safety, at least in Europe and the U.S., will win out. And I think you're going to see that uh, it's still going to take some time to get to a safe 811 battery. Now, notwithstanding that point, it's worth noting that we're talking about the NMC battery, the nickel manganese cobalt battery. If you look at the NCA battery, which is the Tesla battery, effectively the only one that, that uses that chemistry, they're already kind of at an 811 today. Uh, and, and you know, you can see in, in um, the fires that Tesla has that they haven't perfected that. And, and in fact, in order to make the 811 work, Tesla has an exceptionally complex um, computer system algorithm to, to keep it cool. So long story short, yes, we will get to an 811. Uh, a lot of people are working on it, but you know, it's not happening tomorrow. And I think with lower commodity prices, like in cobalt in particular right now, they don't feel the pressure that they would have felt 18 months ago when, when cobalt was, you know, uh, above $40. Let's move on and talk about the LME and in particular the chart for the LME nickel warehouse stock level. Uh, the stock bar has been running down over the last few years and I just want to understand do you see this trend continuing and how important is this as an indicator for the nickel market? Is the warehouse stock level something that traders and institutional investors keep a close eye on? You know I think people watch it really really the LME uh, nickel stockpiles sort of started declining in Q4 of of 2016, um, and and have remained stagnant and declined, you know, even further. I think they've dropped below 200,000 tons in, in 2018, and, and seems to have stabilized 160,000 metric tons today. So I do think that that is relevant, but I think it's relevant when nickel starts to turn. Um, you know, obviously looking forward, if there's not significant investment in nickel, there's going to be some major issues in meeting the demand, not just from electric vehicles, but just more broadly from electrification. But I think when those uh, stockpiles running down really play is when you have a sentiment shift. So when sentiment shifts, that's really when you could you could see that that would be a factor. I would say at the moment, until that sentiment around, around nickel shifts and, and some excitement enters the market, it's probably not a particularly um, important factor. But the instant sentiment shifts, those low stockpiles will definitely play a factor in what I would see as a more heightened move up when, when that time comes. 
the price action within the nickel market over the last couple of years certainly hasn't excited many investors, even with the ongoing continued demand beginning to come from EVs. So I want to ask you, Anthony, about the last nickel bull market in 2006-2007 period when prices reached an all-time high. What was it like back then to be in that market? And what was the narrative that drove that market back then? So that was a completely different market because that, that market was really driven by China and it was driven by steel. I mean, you know, even today, the majority of, of nickel is used in steel. And so what you had was, and, and in a lot of ways, it's very analogous to what's happening today, just a completely different story. You had um, China interstage left, um, complete industrial revolution, taking a country from, you know, a, a communist country into what's now really um, a modern marvel, the Chinese miracle in terms of what they've done for that economy. And so they needed a huge amount of, of nickel. And, you know, that allowed for Murren Murren, Kosi, Bulong, um, you know, and then later into the 2000s, Ravensthorpe and Batavi, Goro, uh, who else? Baru Alto, Kanimobo to be built. And what really happened at the peak was uh, the Chinese figured out a way to, through technology, to sort of uh, come up with this... HPAL NPI technology that completely rebased the production costs. And so that's what transformed it. And it really has, I would say, in a way, I don't want to say killed, but it effectively kind of killed the nickel market um, because of the supply that came in. And, you know, it's important to note that what's happening now is analogous in the sense that you have that kind of steady global growth, GDP growth, but you have a new entrant in, in this form of electric vehicles and battery storage and electrification more broadly. And that relies on a completely different part of the nickel market. Mind you, the nickel market is kind of a 2.2 million ton market today with half of it sort of... Um, being like a nickel sulfide class one uh, nickel and the balance being more of an MPI. And, you know, what you're going to see happen is tremendous pressure being put on that class one nickel. And even today, you know, for for certain types of, of nickel, you're seeing, you know, a $1 premium over whatever the LME spot price is. And, you know, what I suspect is going to happen is that as that nickel ramp up happens with the acceleration of the adoption of the electric vehicle, is you're going to need to start to see nickel mines built. And this is also kind of, it's relevant for cobalt as well, because I think one of the open questions, you know, three to five years out is where is this additional cobalt going to come from? And the answer is nickel mines and copper mines. And so as these EVs are purchased and the batteries are purchased, and as the chemistry moves to a more nickel rich chemistry, you need, you know, tremendous capex to be spent to actually meet that demand. Now, uh, about six months ago, in, in Indonesia, there was this news which was very confusing in the market. The same the uh, same group or one of the groups that helped revolutionize the NPI technology uh, was kind of putting a unit on for $700 million to an already existing unit to create from NPI class 1 nickel. But that really confused the market and it was slightly inaccurate because the, the market initially read that as being that you were going to create, create class 1 nickel for $700 million capex. When actually what the what was really happening there was that uh, there was seven billion dollars of capex spent at the place, and for another seven hundred million dollars you could cross over into class one nickel. So it's a little bit complex, except to say that all the pressure from batteries is really going into this class one nickel, and you know you probably need nickel to double from here for any kind of economic conversion from NPI, and you certainly need the price to go up from here in order to build any of the projects that could supply nickel directly into the cathode makers. Let's step back a bit and talk about investing in the markets in general. And I'd like to understand a bit about your career to date in terms of the authors or books that you've read that have helped shape your mindset and especially a contrarian mindset. Can you talk to us about this? Yeah, like I, I kind of, um, I like to break the books down into kind of categories. And you know, I, I like one category is is biographies. You know, you, you look at things like uh, are people like Elon Musk, and, and you read about his life and and what he did, or you look at space barons or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, and all these great entrepreneurs. You know, I think you find have a few things in common: incredible uh, amounts of hard work and determination, 
but timing and luck as well. And so I think reading biographies, I, I always find incredibly, uh, incredibly interesting in putting it all in perspective and, and never discounting luck. Um, some of the books I liked in terms of our industry are, are things like King Leopold's Ghost, you know, uh, the ultimate promoter and what he did in the Congo and understanding Africa. Um, and then books like The King of Oil about Mark Rich, Big Score, Robert Friedland and Boise's Bay, Bonanza King about the Comstock load. Uh, so those are some industry books. And then I think there are books like, you know, about what went wrong, like Billion Dollar Whale and Bad Blood and, and, and some of those types of books. Um, and then I think the final kind of, of the four categories, types of books that, that I really uh, enjoy are sort of books by people who've done it. You know, uh, Ray Dalio, Principles, uh, Big Debt Crisis, uh, the Alchemy of Finance, you know, I think Soros wrote that, um, Intelligent Investor, Benjamin Graham. So, you know, I kind of categorize it depending on the mood, but each one of those um, really helps to kind of shape how I think about the world. Excellent. Some great suggestions there. OK, as we begin to wrap up, let's talk about your recent news and go through perhaps your new company, Nickel 28. Yeah, so um, you know, nickel twenty eight is is really uh, a combination of of a number of assets. Um, the first one is the royalty on Turnigan. Turnigan is one of the largest undeveloped nickel sulfide projects out there. Um, you know, can ship a twenty five percent nickel con. Extremely exciting as the cycle moves forward with nickel. Uh, there's another royalty on Dumont, one of the only, if not the only, shovel ready nickel project in canada so huge huge optionality for both nickel and cobalt on those two investments as their their royalties that include everything and then the cornerstone asset is is ramu and you know ramu is one of the best operating uh, you know hpop facilities in the world it it produces a, it over 100 percent of, of nameplate capacity um it's been been producing now for a number of years and so I think with those three assets, you actually are are getting the nickel exposure. You get uh, a smaller cobalt exposure. Um, obviously, Ramu is a producing mine, and so the joint venture interest uh, has cash flow associated with it. And, and so it's a very unique profile. In fact, I, I believe on launch it will be maybe even the second largest uh, TSX listed nickel pure play. So. You know, Justin and I are both very excited about the prospects of, of Nickel 28 and also, you know, more specifically just Nickel with some of the stuff we spoke about as these chemistries continue to evolve towards a more Nickel-rich chemistry. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Anthony. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector junior mining sector are good people and kind people hit the bid how violent that term could be it actually could be quite violent uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally and the world is always going to need raw material it's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth totally destabilized hey hey troll did you hear what's going on in yemen